Hello, English 101. Um, I, we need quite a bit of writing intervention. So what I think I'm going to do right now is focus on three specific areas where I saw a lot of struggling in the most recent essay, um, your second essay. Um, and um, I'll give you some exercises to do around those things. And then I think what we're going to do is work on just paragraph level unity of paragraph, which I think we talked about in the last, um, the last video. So what your assignment is going to be for anybody who received below an 80 on your second essay, which is a large portion of the class, I want you to watch last week's video, this week's video, do the homework, and rewrite your essay. Um, and you can submit the rewrite to me by next Wednesday. All right, so this is now our whiteboard or our cardboard. <laughs> um, let's talk about sentence fragments. So we've talked about this in class already, but um, a, hold on, let me get rid of anything that might make a sound. So a sentence has, a basic sentence, a simple sentence, has two parts, right? Subject and predicate. The subject is what the sentence is about. It's also usually the actor in the sentence, the person doing the work in the sentence, um, doing the action in the sentence. And the predicate is the action or the um, verb phrase. Uh, it's what's happening, right? Even I am. I am is a full simple sentence. I am the subject. Am is the predicate. Am is a form, a conjugation of the verb to be, right? And it's a state of being. It's still, it, it, it is a verb. It's a, a passive verb. It's not a action verb, right? I run is also a full sentence. Um, so let's build a sentence together and let's look at what is not a sentence. All right, the dog. This is not a sentence. What is it missing? It is missing a predicate. You cannot put this in a paper, not that you would, but you can't write this and put a period afterwards because you're not saying anything, right? The dog is the subject, right? This is our subject. This is an article. An article is the, a, am. Um, it, it points to um, usually the noun that comes after it, and which is often a subject, but it could be an object too. But we're not even gonna get into objects, so don't worry about that. All right, the dog, what? What is the dog doing? What do we want as a predicate phrase? <sighs> The dog chases the cat. I lied, we are gonna get into um, the object. This is the predicate of the sentence, chases the cat. Chases is the verb. The cat is the object. Okay, the cat is the recipient of the action. The dog is the actor of the action, all right? I'm glad that this is the sentence we came up with because I want, again, to touch base with you on passive construction. Passive construction leads to too many words and it weakens your writing and it weakens your sentences. So how would I turn this active sentence where the dog is the actor and the dog is at the beginning of the sentence, so therefore the focus of the sentence and carrying out the action? Um, well, we would need to switch the sentence around so that the object, the cat, is at the beginning. Okay, here we have a bumbling and inefficient sentence. The cat was chased by the dog, 
okay? We have two extra words, two additional words from our first sentence, which was more concise and more powerful, and what we have is passive construction. The cat is not doing the action. The cat is receiving this action, right? The cat is receiving being chased by the dog. When you put your actor, your, your subject that's doing the action at the end of the sentence, you risk losing your audience's attention um, from the beginning, right? Because when we see the cat at the beginning of a sentence, we expect the sentence to be about what the cat is doing, not just about the cat. Of course, this sentence has content with the cat in it, right? But we expect an action to be associated with the cat. It's not here, right? The cat, we have to wait till all the way to the end of the sentence to understand what the cat is experiencing, right? That is not efficient writing. It's not powerful writing. It reduces the strength of your sentences and it leads to problems like lack of concision, um, which we talked about last video, okay? So this is a little lesson in sentence structure. Very, very light, tiny little lesson in sentence structure. But let's talk about fragments. So if we just said the cat, nope, the dog, the dog is a fragment, right? But now let's apply this to what you guys have been writing about. None of you are writing about cats or dogs chasing each other or being chased. You are writing about um, many different topics in a pretty challenging assignment, which was a textual analysis um, in a mixed genre essay. Um, so when you're doing analysis, this is where I'm seeing some of these mistakes come in. You're stringing together sometimes fragments that to you carry some meaning in your head, but don't actually carry meaning to your reader. So I'm reading it and I'm like, what? Because <laughs> um, I know you know what you're saying, but I don't know what you're saying. And it's, it's, it's strikingly apparent when you are writing about a topic I didn't assign you, right? You have to be even more careful about context. That's one of the reasons we back away from my assignments in the second essay and the third essay, because I want you to understand that if you're choosing the topic, I have no background about it. I don't know what you're talking about, which means you have to be very thorough with your context and with your delivery. So uh, fragments are a delivery problem. Um, if you are analyzing, say you're analyzing a commercial for a female product of some kind, maybe a razor, right? Um, and in this commercial, there is um, women at the beach, like slender, blonde women at the beach, and there's lots of shots of their legs. And you can see how smooth their legs are, and then it goes to a shot of a woman in the shower shaving her legs, right? And your point is that the entire um, advertisement is resting on the idea that these slender blonde women are the feminine ideal and you are criticizing that right so say you have that's a that's a strong topic right that's a great idea to write about but the problem is that we can get lost in our thoughts about that so you might have a sentence like the commercial begins with a view of women on the beach. Beautiful and splendor. Okay, what is the problem here? Can you see that? The problem here is that beautiful and slender is a modification, it's a description of the, the women at the beach, right? It is not a full sentence. Beautiful and slender is simply two adjectives joined with a conjunction. There's no subject and there's no predicate. If you and I were having a conversation and you're describing the commercial to me and you might say, yeah, there's all these women on the beach and they're like frolicking around, you can see their legs are smooth, and then I interrupt you and say, Oh, what color is their hair? And you say, 
blonde and beautiful and slender, you might say they're beautiful and slender, but in conversation, there might be a time when it would make sense for you to add these modifications um, as fragments, right? Um, because that's sometimes how we speak. Sometimes poetry uses it as a stylistic effect. However, in an academic essay, it's never okay to separate your modifiers from your, uh, the noun that you're modifying or your subject um, or your action, your predicate from your subject, right? Um, and that's a confusing way to say it, but look at every single unit. The smallest units of your paper are words, and after that are your sentences. And think of a sentence as a building block. If you do not have a full sentence, once you're looking at those sentences, examine it for subject and predicate. The subject is always going to be a noun. The predicate needs to have a verb in it. If you're missing those two things in a sentence, you have a fragment. If you have a fragment, just like when we use passive construction, your um, essay is going to be littered with unnecessary words and you're going to have a lack of clarity and that's not what you want. Everybody had amazing selections with regard to topic. Everybody had wonderful insight into what you were talking about and some of you, I lost access to that insight because of the lack of clarity in the writing. So um, I did my best to give individual feedback to every single person um, in comments so that you would see exactly where you individually are doing this. Um, but um, if you need help, I have Office Hours tomorrow, which you can sign up for. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that. I'm going to move on to the next thing, which is plagiarism. Okay, so plagiarism is very tricky. Um, I got to get into a better position for this heavy discussion about plagiarism. Okay, so plagiarism can sneak up on you, even if you are not trying to plagiarize. I mean, there's plenty of people who copy and paste things and just don't care and hope they get away with it. You'll never get away with it because from the first writing assignment that I, well, let me take that back. It's possible I'll miss something, but please don't even try. If you're in college, you don't need to try to plagiarize. And I don't think anyone is trying to plagiarize. I think what I've seen for plagiarism has been mostly by mistake. Um, but just know this about your teachers. From the first assignment I collect from you, which is your in-class writing, answers to questionnaires, and from class discussions, and from your first essay, I have basically um, this almost forensic snapshot of your writing voice and your writing style. And once you've been teaching for a while, it's pretty easy to tell when someone is incorporating words they're unfamiliar with into their own writing, and that's totally fine. I do that, and sometimes I use the words wrong, right? But there's a difference between that and whole sentences that I know don't sound like you, but also don't sound like anyone in the class or me, because there's ways of writing in which uh, we would use for Wikipedia or for an investigative journalism piece, right, that we're not writing that style in class. So when I see that there's something that doesn't match up as far as syntax goes, which is like the order of your words and your sentence um, and the way the sentence is put together, um, I look it up. And when I look it up and it brings me to an article, and I can trace back, you know, even even 40%, if it's even 40% matched, that's plagiarism. You can't just gather information and use the same uh, presentation, especially in order of that information. That's not what research is, and that's not what sources should be used for. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that some people are rewording sentences and thinking that that's not plagiarism. It's still plagiarism if you're taking directly from one source and using it in your um, piece without attribution. Um, you need to be attributing information to every source you have. So, um, and you still need to be synthesizing the information and then writing it in your own voice. Um, I have some worksheets on this. Um, there's a limitation to how I can just, how much I can 
talk you through this or walk you through it verbally. So I'll leave you some worksheets, but or not worksheets, like handouts, like some more information on it. Um, I'm sure there's better videos than what I'm making on it. I'll try to find that too. Um, but this is really important. Um, I am choosing to make an assumption that no one is trying to plagiarize, um, which means I'm giving you an opportunity to rewrite and to address this problem, but um, other people will not take that same perspective as you move through your education. So this is just, it's a really important thing we learn about now and we learn to address. Um, what else did I need to talk to you about? Okay, on that note, let's talk about uh, introducing sources. So um, somebody wrote some great analysis on a source they never introduced, so I never knew what they were talking about. Um, you can't do that. I don't, I'm not inside your head, um, and I did not assign the topics for this. So um, you need to give me, and any reader, you need to give us the background in the context. Honestly, all of this is addressed in our essay structure, so go back to that. If you don't have background information in your intro, you didn't do what you're supposed to do in an intro. If you don't have context before evidence, you didn't do what you're supposed to do in a body paragraph. And I know we want to move beyond this kind of like formulaic approach, but you need to have these essential pieces down because that's part of the plagiarism issue. If you are quoting somebody and not saying where it's from, that's considered plagiarism too, even if there are quotation marks around it, because you didn't actually give credit to the, the person who originally came up with this. Um, so context, 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 and background information. I would encourage you to, once again, watch last week's video because we did go over this, and go back over the sample essays I've handed out, um, and uh, look at how you labeled them. We spent a long time in class looking at that for this reason, so that when you got to your independent stage of writing, you would be able to look at that and have a guide. So please use those tool tools that we already put together before you know the pandemic struck. Um, textual analysis. Very few people actually did the assignment, which was to analyze a text, and the text had to have some component that was not written. It couldn't just be analyzing a poem. I mean, even song lyrics are uh, a text, right? Um, and so that's why I guided you towards looking at something like a film, an image, a painting, a commercial. Um, we were supposed to be moving beyond reading as a form of text, a, a, a reading or a piece of writing as a form of text, to how the entire world is a text, right? Um, so textual analysis, we need a little bit of work on that. Um, I will try to find an activity. It's hard to do that away from you, but I'll try to think of a way to give you some practice for that. Um, whew, transition sentences. Uh, so this was a, a big thing that was missing for a lot of people as well. Um, when you are bringing more than one idea together in a paragraph, you need a transition sentence to make that, um, to make it smooth. The movement from one idea to the next needs to be smooth. Um, but also between ideas, between paragraphs, we need to be working on transition there as well. And so um, this can look like closing out one idea and leading into the next. A lot of times I saw people in the same way that you might drop a quotation in without giving context, dropping a new idea without moving on from the old idea. Um, all of that needs to be addressed and changed. So transitions transitions happen at two levels. Um, they happen at the word level. So a transition at the word level would be something like however, or therefore, or because, and they all hold different meanings. However is a switch in your um, reasoning, right? You might say, well, this is true because blah, 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 blah. However, this is also true, and that might be you introducing kind of the, the conflicting idea and saying how there's merit to that as well um, because it's sort of cause and effect or it's kind of pointing to a reason for something. Um, I don't remember what else I said. Oh, further, oh, therefore, furthermore, um, these are like, furthermore is when you're adding something that helps 
uh, transition you from one idea to the next when they're similar. Um, and therefore is a result. So this, 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 and this, therefore this is true, right? Um, so transitions at the word level are really important. I can give you a handout for that under the video. Um, but transition sentences are important too. Um, I'm sure there's a really good handout. I've used good handouts for that before. The old book I had used to have some really good work on that. Um, I, all of this is in the back of your book too, so read the back of your book. Um, but I will give you some specific like PDF accessible online pieces in case you don't have the book. Um, so those are the major problems I saw. Also, please, you, I'm going to not accept things if they are submitted in PDF form because I can't edit them. So it needs to be Google Docs, not Word Docs, and it needs to be um, a document form, not a PDF form. Um, that is essential. So please start doing that correctly. If you need help or a tutorial, email me and I'll help you with that. Um, spell check. Please do not submit pieces without spell checking. I'm getting essays that have red squiggly lines all throughout them. There's no excuse for that. Your computer does it for you. All you have to do in Google Docs is click on the red squiggly line and it will tell you the correct um, spelling. Uh, the blue squiggly line is as talking to you about gra grammatical errors or subject verb agreement, things that are not spelling errors but are errors nonetheless. Um, click on both of those and it'll fix it for you. In Word doc, which you shouldn't be using anyway, you have to like right click on it or something and then the, the suggestion comes up. But you can, you need to do that. It's, it's helping you learn. It's the same reason that when I'm editing your drafts and giving you feedback, I do not just make edits, I do suggestions because I want you to actually look at each one of them, go through it and decide what you want to keep, what you don't want to keep, and, and have to like face each mistake so you understand the correction to it, right? Um, so please proofread your work before you send it in. And you don't even have to do much to proofread. It's already being proofread for you by your computer. So please, please, please be aware of that. Um, if you are a person working from a phone, I'm not really sure actually how it works on the phone because um, I've never used Google Docs on the phone. Other, Well, I have, but not like, I haven't written, I've only edited. I haven't like written a piece from the beginning. So um, if that's one of the problems you're having is working from the phone and it's not letting you do that, let me know and I'll try to see if I can find a way around that um, or to help you figure that out. Um, what else? Um, I feel like I know there's more. Um, oh, citations. Y'all are not putting in citations or if you are, you're making up a way to do it. Um, we didn't extensively go over MLA in class, but it's so simple. I need you to be looking up how to fix some of these problems um, instead of relying on me to do it for you because I'm not going to. I don't have time to do it, but also this is like a fundamental basic stuff that you can very easily find online. So if you have a question about how to do a works cited page in MLA, just Google that. If you have a question about how to cite a um, online article in MLA, Google it. <laughs> That's what I do when I'm giving you information. Some of this stuff I have memorized and some of it I always have to check. And MLA in particular changes often. So I'm always double checking online. I'm always Googling, researching, looking things up for yourself. You need to start doing that. That's an, a really important academic habit to get in the habit of. If you look something up and you're not sure if the information is right, send me an email. But please take the initiative to look it up on your own. This is this is something you should have learned in your previous schooling, whether it was high school or another college. Um, but it's certainly something you should be activating and doing now in college, especially in English 101. Um, I think that's it. So if you have an 80 or above, you have no homework this week. If you have um, an 80 or below an 80, 79 or below, you are watching last week's video again, you're watching this week's video, and you're doing all the homework posted underneath it, um, all the practice and on skills, and you are uh, addressing your drafts, fixing everything, and resubmitting it by next Wednesday. Um, I think that's all I have. I'm not moving forward with assignments until we get this done, because um, when 
I'm getting drafts of this level. It's taking me like three days to go through our 15 class drafts um, where it really should be taking half of that time, maybe less than half of that time. So the stronger your writing is, the less time it will take me to give you feedback, which is what we need because we need to be moving forward, which means I need to be producing new content for you, which is very difficult in an online we're not in class together. It's much easier for me to teach in class with you. When I do these uh, videos, I have to spend a lot more time preparing um, and figuring out how it's going to translate. And so um, please address this so that we can move forward. So 80 and above, you don't have homework. Um, 79 or below, you're fixing all of your errors in your essay uh, or rewriting the essay. Some folks need full rewrites. Um, and uh, office hours are tomorrow from 9 to 11. If we need more time than that, I'm willing to extend it. Please sign up for a slot. I have only given 10 minute slots so I could fit as many people in as I could for those two hours. But if, if you need more than 10 minutes, which I think some of you will want, um, if there's no one uh, in front of you or behind you, that's fine. We can take more time. But um, if there is somebody, then um, I will extend the office hours. Finally, for office hours, we're using Google Hangouts, so you need to be online and active on your Gmail account. All right, I think that's all I had for right now. I will talk to you soon.